All right, here's Super Pong Telegames. I've uh, never used one of these before. I've had this sitting around a long time. I happened to come into possession of it. Uh, it comes with, uh, the. there's another version that has four controllers, but this one only has two. Got rheostat controllers like the Atari. Looks like you got a game select switch down here. On, off, game reset. I don't know what that is, at least not yet. And um, of course they have a nice storage area. Uh, the whole thing runs on just uh, six volts. Here's the power supply. Uh, excuse me, battery eliminator. And RF cord, pretty much the same thing as the Atari 2600 has. So let's take a look inside this thing. Now remarkably, there is a battery compartment in here. And it contains 4D batteries. And of course those can leak and cause all sorts of problems and mess, a big mess, etc, etc. Alright, first step to getting in this thing is to take this panel, this battery cover, off. And the way that seems to work is you get in here and pry it with a screwdriver. And then you've got to come over a little bit further. There's one here that is somewhat difficult. Yep, there we go. And thankfully this thing was not stored with batteries in it because that would have been a disaster. All right, so as far as looking inside, what we have are these little security screws. They're sort of a tri-lobed uh, tamper-proof screw. I'm not sure what that's called. I've tried looking it up on the internet and I could not find uh, the exact screw type. I'm sure it's out there. This thing was probably made in 1976, so I, you know, it's possible that whatever this is is just obsolete. And one way to deal with these is to drill them out or grind them off. Uh, I'm going to try a different approach. Okay, so what I did, I uh, used a little bit of this. It's not uh, greasy or oily or as petroleum based as uh, WD-40, just to get hopefully a little bit in there. And then it's possible to come in here with a pair of pliers and just grab the screw head. It's, it is uh, tall enough, proud enough of the surface to do that. And then you can just sort of rotate it a little bit. First, we have to remove this. And I knew we were gonna have to do that, but I wanted to make sure we at least had a chance of getting in there and undoing these because removing this, if we can't remove those, then it's, it's all for nothing. But those are just some Phillips screws and uh, you know, hopefully I won't lose them. Um, all right, so that was easy. And uh, as it turns out, there's a channel select switch down in there, which I know if I read the instructions, of course, my excuse is I don't have them, so I guess that's okay. And uh, I don't think I'm going to lose the screws because I have my uh, Commodore 64 VIC-2 heat shield tray that I like to use for these things. All right, once those screws are removed, this comes off of the bottom and the bottom separates from the top part. And I tell you, these screws, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a replacement, well, uh, at least around here. I might have to go get a screw from the hardware store or something. And here's what we have so far. Um, I mean, that's what the inside of this thing looks like. There's an electro, electrolytic capacitor in there. I don't see that it's leaking. There's a speaker. I guess the speaker for these things is internal. I've heard that soldering these boards, it's easy to... to... Uh, um, damage them. Alright, let's get a good view of those connectors because we're going to need to know where they go. And now we should be able to get the, the RF shield off. We should be able to pry that off. 
just a, a note, the way these particular connectors work is there's a little tab here that you move back. And on this unit, they still seem to have flex to them. I don't know if this, you know, what this plastic is. Uh, it, 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 it aged well enough that they didn't just snap. But that's one thing you'll have to look into. And I, I can't emphasize enough, it's not possible to take too many pictures of something when you're taking it apart. So this is the inside of a super, uh, this is the inside of the Super Pong machine. And, uh, you know, I get that chip right there. It's probably the heart of it. Another thing I've noticed that you probably want to, if you get into one of these, you might want to uh, keep in mind is that these switches here, if you take one out, they are held in by basically just melted plastic. The plastic, there's plastic studs that they slid onto, and then those were melted down like a plastic rivet. And that also goes for this switch in here. And whatever this is, is probably going to be harder to find a replacement for. So... If there's any um, dirt in there, hopefully we can just clean it out with some contact cleaner. You can see this one also has like a plastic stud it was put down on and then that was turned into a rivet by melting it. All right, taking that picture really helped because I would not have gotten these back in their proper positions. And as I get ready to close this back up, I don't see anything in here that's you know, obviously no leaking capacitor, so I'm gonna close it back up and try it. Uh, you definitely want to note there's a knot here in this, this goes to one of the controllers, this goes to the other controller in this unit. Uh, the Super Pong just has two. Super Pong 4 has four controllers, that's why it's called 4. But it's important to note here that you have a knot in the cables for strain relief. And if that ended up on the outside, it would become very easy to, to probably rip the wire out of here accidentally. Alright, so I got it back in. Uh, I put just a little bit of this stuff on the tips of those long screws they only just the very tip threads into anything there's a plastic stud under there uh, you want to be careful you don't crank anything down too hard because it probably will break that off and then you'll have to go in and repair it but um, I got these back in to the hole and was able to just tighten them down mostly by by hand or by using pliers and to line it up correctly because they have to go through the, the circuit board itself um, you know I had I kind of held this in place and was able to look down here and let them into uh, the right opening and then um, thread them in but I'm not going to thread them in like really tight I mean one I don't have the proper screwdriver and um, I need to get in case I need to get them off again Okay, so I'm just going to take off the knob to this controller. And the way I did that, I prefer to do it, is get these two small flathead screwdrivers. You get them under there on opposing sides so you aren't torquing the knob one way or another. And then you can just kind of lift up a little bit by little bit turn that way see how that works all right let's see if we can just pull it off right now try to apply that force as evenly as possible oh, there we go and that's that and there's a nut there in case you want to take the rheostat out we might have to do that to clean it i don't know and then the back part, you got a single screw. There is a little post down at this end, and it's something a shape like this on one half that goes into a, 
a hole on the other. And that has taken a bit of a set over the years. So if we can try to, with the minimal amount of any sort of scratching for this case, uh, get in there and there we go. See, it's this uh, hexagonal shaped piece goes into there and over time it just likes to stick. And that's it. Looks like we've got an uh, Atari part number, C010061. That's, I think that's full. 400 and about 650,000 ohms. And I'll start turning it clockwise. It's like nothing. This is a huge dead spot. That might not be a big deal. The meter's going to switch over here. It's bouncing around. Yeah, it's probably going to have some jitter in it. I don't know how much the system will smooth that out. All right, so took a chance and I have here some contact cleaner, this particular brand. And I shot it a good amount of it, two, two pretty, pretty good blasts of it right in here. And now I've got the Rheostat cranked all the way over clockwise to the stop. And I'll just start slowly moving it counterclockwise. And you can see we seem to have a much smoother, more steady reading. Although we'll have to see if this translates into less jitter. It may, maybe it's still not steady enough, I don't know for sure. Putting this uh, screw back into plastic. Go counterclockwise. You hear that little click? You see it drop down? Now go clockwise. And that goes in real easily. I don't even have my fingers on the screwdriver handle. Yep, that's how you avoid cross-threading. All right, next thing I'm going to do is just uh, clean this thing up because it's very dusty. It's dusty from storage. It was kind of dirty when it first came to me. Uh, oh, wow, probably more than 20 years ago. And um, I just like it to be a little let, less filthy when I start, you know, testing it. What I like to use first... Probably, other than soap and water, uh, just glass cleaner. This is called Windex, uh, but it's, it's just gla ammonia-based glass cleaner. This stuff, isopropyl alcohol in a spray bottle is extremely convenient. It's great for all kinds of things. You do want to use caution when you sw if you switch to using this stuff. It's like the next uh, level up from the glass cleaner and soap and water because it can do things like rub off the uh, labels here uh, and very important to note if you put iso alcohol on the keys to some vic 20s commodore vic 20s and commodore 64s it will destroy the petsky characters that are printed on the fronts of the keys it will wipe them out instantly they will start running and it's a disaster some keyboards didn't seem to mind it but i eventually ran into one where I sprayed it and it was like paint stripper. So, yeah, this is good for a lot of things, but uh, you, know, you might want to try it on a little place that no one's going to see first or something like that. All right, that's it. You can see the sound comes from the machine, not the TV. I have the TV sound turned off. So if I go to start game, this is game number one, and I guess it's the opposite. Like you're supposed to, you're supposed to get the ball to go through the, the gap. And you can see that the the real stats and the control paddles are working fairly well. I don't see any jitter. Let's 
see if I can. This is actually pretty hard. Now, there is a slight distortion up at the top. Uh, I believe the top and bottom, those gray bars, are pretty much supposed to be off screen. I mean, clearly the, uh, the bouncy ball is not going outside of those bounds. This is game two. Game three and game... Well, we got four games here. This should be game four. One, two, three. Well, they leave little trails on the screen there. How about that? This is four. I guess four is like the normal pong. Oh, here we go. So aside from that, that uh, distortion up near the top, when the numbers are on the screen, it seems to work. See, better view of the colors here. This is sort of the startup screen when you turn it on. And uh, you can still move the little controller paddles here and here. But the colors are actually nice. It's like a spectrum across the screen as opposed to having um, individual colors, I suppose. 